Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this episode 30 UFO Landing Trace Cases. There are many thousands of cases on record in which UFOs have landed on Earth. Much smaller are the number of cases in which they leave actual hard evidence. These are called landing traces and they come in many forms. These include crushed vegetation, swirled grass, indentations on the ground, burn marks, radiation readings in some cases, unusual elements. There's many different types of UFO landing traces. But these cases have been occurring for a very long time, many decades, and are still occurring to the present day. They have occurred all over the world, and what I like about these cases is they provide hard evidence of the reality of UFOs. Skeptics often say, if UFOs are real, where's the evidence? Well, here it is. And what I'd like to do today is present to you a chronology of some of the best cases. And I've got a lot of them, so let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk about is probably the most famous case of a landing trace. And that is, of course, the Socorro, New Mexico UFO landing. This occurred on April 24, 1964. And there are actually a number of witnesses to activity at that time. There were two gentlemen, Paul Keyes and Larry Kratzer, who apparently saw a UFO while driving along Highway 60, moving towards the area where Socorro police officer Lonnie Zamora would see this UFO land. At the time, Lonnie Zamora was in pursuit of a speeding motorist when he heard a loud roaring sound and looking towards the source of this noise, he saw a bright flaming object descend behind a small hill near the location of a dynamite shack. And he thought that the, perhaps the shack had exploded, so he drove to the top of the hill and to his shock he saw a small shiny object landed next to the road and two short figures standing next to it. He said they appeared to be working on this object. He first assumed that there had been some sort of auto accident and he radioed headquarters that an accident had in fact occurred. Meanwhile, he continued to drive towards this object, approaching to within about 100 feet. And I'll just quote Lonnie Zamora from his notes following this incident. As Lonnie says, it looked at first like a car turned upside down. Thought some kids might have turned it over. Saw two people in white coveralls very close to the object. One of these persons seemed to turn and look straight at my car and seemed startled. Seemed to quickly jump somewhat. At this time, I began moving my car towards them quickly with the idea to help. Object was like aluminum, was whitish against the mesa background, not chrome, seemed like oval in shape, and I, at first glance, took it to be an overturned white car. The only time I saw these two persons was when I had stopped for possibly two seconds or so to glance at the object. Those persons appeared normal in shape, but possibly they were small adults or large kids. So Lonnie drove up to the top of this hill, um, and as he drove up this hill, the object went out of view behind this hill, but as he got to the top of the hill, the figures were no longer visible. He could see this craft, which appeared to be sitting on landing gear. Seconds later, he heard two thumping sounds and a loud roar. This craft rose upwards, emitting a blast of flame. Zamora jumped behind his car for, for protection, and he says this craft rose up and barely cleared the dynamite shack. The flame then became extinguished, the roar stopped, and a whining sound began, and the craft flew away in a bobbing motion at very low altitude. And as it left, Lani Zamora observed a strange red-colored symbol on the side of the craft. And it was moments later that his partner, Police Sergeant Sam Chavez, arrived, and they went to the site of where this object had been on the ground, and both of them discovered landing traces where this craft had rested. 
They said there was four deep indentations on the earth, a burnt mesquite bush, and charred grass. And not only that, the rock where this craft had sat also appeared to be melted and fused. And according to researchers, Ann Ruffle and William Moore, within 45 minutes, military personnel were on the scene. They took away samples of the melted rock, the burned soil and vegetation. Lonnie Zamora, as it turns out, was friends with Dr. Lincoln La Paz, the famous astronomer. So he heard about this sighting very early on and Air Force investigators converged on the scene. J. Allen Hynek also investigated the incident shortly after it happened, and he measured these landing marks, determining that the center of gravity of this object corresponded exactly to the location of the burned foliage. At this time, Hynek was still somewhat skeptical of UFOs, but after investigating this case, he was baffled and later wrote that this incident was one of the, quote, major UFO sightings in the history of the Air Force's consideration of this subject. So this object was not far away from the local Socorro Airport, and Hynek was surprised it was not caught on their radar, but according to researchers Jim and Coral Lorenzen, who also investigated this incident, they learned that the airport radar had been shut down, and they speculated that perhaps the facility at White Sands, which did have their radar on, was tracking the object, and this would explain why military officials showed up within hours of the incident. So this was not only investigated by the Air Force, but also by the FBI. We know this because of documents released through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, FBI agent D. Arthur Burns was one of the investigators, and uh, he and Air Force Captain Richard T. Holder interviewed Lonnie Zamora, and Zamora uh, speculated that perhaps this craft was a secret government craft, whereas Air Force Captain Richard Holder suggested that Lonnie might have been the victim of a hoax. Lonnie Zamora disagreed with this, and despite Captain Holder's comment, it's clear from declassified documents that FBI agent Arthur Burns took this case very seriously. And in fact, in his notes, he wrote that Lonnie Zamora was, quote, a well-regarded, industrious, and conscientious officer and not given to fantasy. So what's really interesting about this particular case is it does not involve just burnt rock, uh, depressions in the ground, and burned vegetation, but there is also what appeared to be metal fragments because uh, this craft did land in an area of very sharp volcanic rock. And in the holes made by this craft's landing gear, there were allegedly metal streaks left by the craft. This is according to Stanton Friedman and Dr. James McDonald, who interviewed a lady by the name of Mary Mays. Mary Mays, at the time of this incident, was working on her master's degree in radiation biology at New Mexico University. And she told Stanton Friedman and Dr. James McDonald that she was actually asked by the university to investigate the landing traces. She visited the site confirmed the melted sand, the burned vegetation. She took samples, which she studied in a lab. She found no evidence of radiation, but did say that the plants were scorched and that there were also two organic substances which she was unable to identify. Afterwards, she was ordered to turn in her report, all the samples, and to, quote, keep quiet about the case. Uh, J. Allen Hynek was very much impressed by the case, and as he later wrote, the Socorro case was basically a single witness sighting, although several other more distant wit witnesses to the object were reported, but the witness was a policeman whose character and record were unimpeachable. Physical traces were left on the ground, and as I personally observed, some of the greasewood bushes in the vicinity had been charged. Major Quintanilla, then head 
of Blue Book was convinced that an actual physical craft had been president. Maybe there is a simple explanation for the Socorro incident, but having made a complete study of the events, I do not think so. It is my opinion that a real physical event occurred on the outskirts of Socorro that afternoon of April 24, 1964. Later, Major Quintanilla of Project Blue Book did try to explain away the incident as a test flight of a secret lunar module. There's no evidence of this, and the Socorro incident became the only case in Blue Book files that was labeled unidentified. It's Blue Book case number 8766. Jim and Coral Lorenzen also investigated this case in detail, and according to them, they found many other witnesses uh, to UFOs before and after the time of this incident. And in fact, there may have been a lot more witnesses than many people realize. Recently, another witness to this incident came forth. Her name is Sally Hagler. She was a Socorro Chamber of Commerce volunteer. And she says that she saw the same object between her home on Lopez Road and the M Mountain. According to her, J. Allen Hynek told her that there were about 400 other witnesses who had also seen the same phenomenon along the mountain. So that is a very impressive case of a UFO landing trace. One of the most famous, but certainly not the only one. And over the next decades, there would be many, many more. The next case I'd like to talk about occurred in Barnesville, Minnesota on May 5th, 1964. The main witness is Alfred Ernst, and he saw a small glowing object on the ground in the field next to his home, about 1,500 feet away. According to Alfred, this object was about four feet across and looked about the size of a washing machine, except it had a rounded bottom. Uh, he was driving at the time. It was about 8 a.m., bright and sunny, but this object was so bright it hurt his eyes and as he watched, this object took off and disappeared into the clouds, making him, quote, uncomfortable. So he continued to drive away, and he returned later to the site to investigate, and this is when he found a three-foot crater-like depression in the field. And not only was there a depression, the ground was much drier than the surrounding terrain, and there was a weird white substance surrounding the crater, which, when analyzed, turned out to be alkaline. Some researchers thought that perhaps ball lightning was responsible, but physicist, atmospheric physicist, Dr. James McDonald looked into the case, and he disputed the ball lightning theory, and to this day, this case remains unexplained. Another excellent case, one of France's most famous landing trace cases, occurred in June, well actually July, but uh, in 1965 in Valençol, France. The main witness is Maurice Mass, and he is a lavender farmer at the time, and he noticed that someone was stealing his lavender plants. This was on June 30th. But the very next day, at 5.45 a.m. on July 1st, 1965, Maurice was in his lavender field checking on the plants when he caught the perpetrator red-handed. And his encounter began when he heard a strange whistling sound, and turning around, he saw a strangely shaped silver object landed in his lavender field. And next to this object stood two short figures with huge bald heads and large eyes. And they were collecting samples of his lavender plants. So Maurice Mass began to approach these figures, at which point one of them pointed a tube-like instrument at him, leaving him temporarily unable to move. 
The creatures then hopped into their craft and departed. Fifteen minutes passed before Maurice was physically able to move and recover, and he reported his encounter to investigators, and his story gained widespread attention, largely because where this object had landed in his lavender field, all the lavender plants died, and no vegetation would grow. So while Maurice Mass was happy to finally discover who was stealing his lavender plants, he became quite upset when hundreds of curiosity seekers trampled his field to see these famous landing traces left by this craft. It's a very well-known case of a UFO landing trace. Here's another very interesting case which took place in Pretoria, South Africa on the night of September 16, 1965. There are two witnesses, both police officers, constables, by the name of John Lockham and Coos de Klerk. They were driving along the Pretoria Highway when they came upon a disc-shaped object resting right on the highway itself. They described it as being copper-colored, about 30 feet in diameter, and on the top of it was a small dome. And as they approached this object, their car engine failed, it died, and this object stayed there for just a few moments, and then without warning, it lifted up off the road, and beneath it was a very powerful flame coming from what appeared to be two tubes on the underside, and as Officer John Lockham says, its liftoff was quicker than anything I have ever seen. These flames uh, came out from underneath the object, but they were so hot, so powerful, that they actually caught the road itself on fire. And these flames were at least three feet high and remained burning long after this object zoomed away and was out of sight. A later investigation showed that this part of the road was actually partially caved in, evidently from a very heavy weight from this object, and the gravel itself had been separated from the tar in a severely burned area about six feet in diameter. Constable John Lockham drew a sketch of this object. This did capture the attention of the military, and in fact, the district commandant of Pretoria, Lieutenant Colonel J.B. Britz, told newspaper reporters that this event was considered, quote, as being of a highly secret nature and an inquiry is being conducted in top circles. So this did, of course, capture the attention of UFO organizations such as NICAP, the National Investigative Committee of Aerial Phenomena, and they learned that this road service surface was being analyzed by a leading scientific agency in South Africa. And they attempted to get copies of the analysis reports, but were unable to do so, and the analysis has never been made public. Nevertheless, it's a very well-documented UFO landing trace case. One year later, half a year later actually, on January 19, 1966, there was a very famous case in Australia, in Tully, Australia, and this landing trace became known as the Tully Saucer Nest. This incident began when a banana farmer by the name of George Pedley was driving an electric tractor near his farm, along the neighbor's farm actually, when the engine began to misfire. At the same time, he heard a strange hissing noise, and without warning, a large saucer-shaped object rose from the ground near him and took off at high speed. He said it was a silvery gray, about 25 feet wide, 9 feet thick, and silent except for this hissing noise. And upon examining the site where this object had risen, he saw that the 6-foot-tall reeds were swirled into a counterclockwise circle, and some of them were actually missing. He also saw what appeared to be 4-inch-long 
footprints leading from the landing site into a plowed field. And I'll just quote George Pedley about what he saw in his own words. As he says, Suddenly, an object rose out of the swamp. When I glanced at it, it was already 30 feet above the ground and at about treetop level. It was a large gray saucer-shaped object, convex on the top and bottom, and measured some 25 feet across and 9 feet high. While I watched, it rose another 30 feet, spinning very fast, then it made a shallow dive and took off with tremendous speed. Climbing at an angle of 45 degrees, it disappeared within seconds in a southwesterly direction. I saw no portholes or antennas, and there was no sign of life either in or about the ship. So this case caused quite a sensation. It became very well known. Investigators uh, were very much interested in this case. It's a very well known, well verified landing trace case that again became known as the Tully Saucer Nest. Now we move to one of Australia's most famous sightings. This occurred in Melbourne, Australia at Westall High School on April 6, 1966. This was during the early noon or around 11 a.m. when two or three saucer-shaped objects showed up over the school and some of them actually began to land. At one, perhaps two of them, landed in a grove of trees behind the school known as the Grange uh, this caught the attention of the children on the playground, and before long, some 200 to 300 children at Westall High School and teachers and school officials all saw these objects as they were darting around. Uh, sh shortly later, little planes showed up and started circling the area. When some of the kids saw that this object had actually landed on the ground, they jumped the fence and ran towards it, and a small handful of kids came upon this landed object. They said it was quite small, featureless, silver, about the size of a small sports car, and it was giving off an intense heat. It was just on the ground for a few moments before it lifted up, turned vertical, and darted off. This whole incident lasted about 20 minutes, so a fairly long time. And after this object left, the witnesses who were there saw that it had left a circle of crushed grass. And according to some witnesses, the grass itself was also burned. And it appeared to have been exposed to a high heat source. Uh, the children were ushered back into the school. The press showed up, as did the military. A cover-up was enacted. And this was covered up successfully for some time, but eventually became very well known. And as I mentioned earlier, it's probably Australia's most famous UFO incident of all times. Researcher Shane Ryan is the lead investigator to this case, and he has interviewed many of the witnesses. In fact, he has interviewed more than 100 of the witnesses who actually saw these landing traces. It's a very well-documented case. New information is still coming out to this day, and it is definitely deserves a place on this list as having some very interesting landing trace evidence. Another case that really deserves more attention than it's gotten occurred in Gwinner, North Dakota. This was on September 13, 1966, at 7.30 a.m., when 12-year-old Randy E. Rotenberger was waiting for the school bus outside his home. And as he, was, as he was waiting, he saw flashing lights in the sky approaching, and as it came closer, he could see it was actually a saucer, your classic silver disc. And as Randy says, it looked like two bowls put together. He could see three protrusions of some sort on the bottom, and what looked like an antenna on top. He said it had red and green lights, and it appeared to be about eight 
feet thick. And as he watched, this thing came down for a landing. Uh, he was very impressed, and he did what anyone should do, is go get more witnesses. And he ran inside and got his mom and told her. And as his mom says, the tone of his voice convinced me there was something wrong. He was scared. So they locked the front door, and she quickly went to call the police. At that point, this object made a very loud sound. And as Randy Rotenberger's mother says, I could hear a noise over the phone. It was a whirring sound. Uh, they went outside, uh, but by this point, the object was gone. Randy and two friends inspected the area where this object was seen, and they found, quote, some burnt marks and tapered holes. Each were about a foot in diameter and five inches deep. These holes formed a triangle, one side measuring 26 feet, the second 23 feet, and the third 22 feet. Uh, these landing traces were examined by many other people. Among them was Cliff Melrow, who, who was the president of the Melrow Manufacturing Company. And as he says, I've been around equipment all my life. Only a heavy piece of equipment could have made these prints. Something made these holes other than someone trying to be funny. This did quickly catch the attention of the military. And in fact, General Homer Goebel, then commander of the Fargo, North Dakota Air National Guard Base, uh, examined these landing traces and pretty much ignored Randy Rotenberger's testimony and gave a very debunking explanation. He said, and I quote, there was a light rain at the time. There could have been ball lightning. Uh, this was not at all consistent with ball lightning. And later, the Air Force agreed that this was not ball lightning. It was unexplained. And in a letter to the National Investigative Committee of Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, Major James H. Eichmann said, the depressions in the ground were compacted solidly. For this, re for this reason, the sighting is carried as unidentified in Air Force files. So year after year, there are cases like this. The next one I'd like to talk about occurred on May 7, 1967, in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. There are two witnesses, uh, both young teenagers. Uh, it occurred at Mount Pleasant Cemetery. 14-year-old uh, Ricky Banyard and his friend Glenn Coate saw a UFO hovering over the graveyard. They said it looked like two bulls attached together and it was sending beams of light down into the graveyard. They didn't actually see it land, but... An inspection of the cemetery later yielded several unexplained rectangular black streaks on the sand and gravel paths leading among the graves. So rocks and pebbles seemed to be charred, but none of the grassy area or trees appeared to have been burned. This uh, was very interesting because investigators actually interviewed the cemetery foreman, Joseph Laforge, who verified that this, these markings had not been there before. So they were apparently made by this object over this cemetery. It's a very interesting case. Another case occurred that same year on October 9, 1965 in Tucson, Arizona. This was in the evening when a 13-year-old boy by the name of Richard, who was the son of a prominent businessman in the area, was riding his bike around the neighborhood, and he came upon an eight-foot-tall, metallic, cylindrical-shaped object resting on the ground about 50 feet away from him. This was in a little creek bed. This object stood on two legs, each of which ended in a large circular pad. Richard could see that this object was unusual, and wondering what it was, he approached closer, 
And when he got to about 35 feet of this object, it suddenly made a deep, low-pitched hum and took off straight upwards, disappearing into the night sky. He approached where this object had landed and saw obvious imprints in the soil. So investigators were alerted and Dr. James McDonald showed up and investigated the case and interviewed the witness. He photographed and examined the landing traces and determined that these two landing pads were 42 inches apart and 13.4 inches wide and they were made in hard packed soil. And because these imprints were a couple of inches deep, it was clear that this object was quite heavy. James McDonald was very much impressed by this case, so much so that he decided to contact Air Force officials at nearby Davis Monthan Air Force Base and inform them about the incident. And they were very interested and sent out Blue Book Air Force personnel to conduct an investigation. And uh, they returned one week later to examine the landing traces. Unfortunately, by this, this time, uh, there had been a rainstorm and the landing traces were washed away. However, Air Force Colonel Raymond Sleeper later wrote a 60-page report on this case, and he labeled it a hoax. Dr. James McDonald vehemently disagreed, as did Jim and Coral Lorenzen, uh, and they believed that this boy had seen a genuine UFO. So it's a very interesting case with landing trace uh, evidence. Next case I'd like to talk about occurred two years later on May 11, 1969 uh, in Chapeau. This is a little town near Pembroke in Ontario, Canada. This occurred at 2 a.m. when an anonymous couple was alerted by their dog howling. They went outside to find a brightly lit object hovering just a few feet above the field near their home. The husband approached at which point this object dimmed. It made a low purring sound, and he could now see that it was in fact a dome-shaped object. It promptly took off and disappeared into the night sky. He went back inside, but the next morning they went out to investigate where this object had landed, and they found three circular depressions equally spaced to form a triangle with a rectangular depression one to two inches in depth near the midpoint of the base of the triangle. Other weird rings were found. Landing trace expert Ted Phillips said that yes, there was this trace, but it was actually only one of four such markings that he found. He found several circles. He said that there was one circle which was 32 feet in diameter, another which was 28 feet in diameter, another which was 28 and a half feet, and a fourth that was nine feet in diameter. So these circular marks showed depressed grass, crushed grass, and one of them had three, quote, pod marks arranged in the center of the grass, which formed a perfect triangle. So this was a very well-verified case of UFO landing traces in that there were multiple witnesses who actually saw this object land in the field and investigators were able to confirm that these depressions were there in the fields exactly where this craft had landed. There's so many cases. It was just two months later on July 13, 1969 when there was another case in Van Horn, Iowa. This occurred at 11 p.m. when a high school girl and her cousin were having a sleepover and they were up at 11 p.m. when they heard this weird sound outside their home and looking out the window they saw an object hovering above the field across the road. It was less than a mile away. This object appeared to be a gray metallic disc. 
Uh, there were no lights on it except for an orange-red band of light around the circumference. And this was bright enough s so that the girls were able to see the shape of this object clearly, which they described as, quote, a shallow inverted bowl with a curved bottom. They saw no portholes, no protrusions of any kind. And as they watched, this object came directly over their farmhouse and in fact so low, the vibrations rattled the bedroom windows. The parents in the house were asleep at the time, did not wake up. According to the two witnesses, this object was about the size of an automobile and was rotating counterclockwise, and off it went into the night sky. The next morning they told the parents what had happened, and they were initially not believed. But later that morning, the father was out walking in the fields and came across a 40-foot diameter circle of dried-out soybean crop, which of course had previously not been there. This was a perfect circle, and it was in a, the exact location where the two witnesses had seen this UFO. And according to uh, the report on this case, all of the leaves of each plant were hanging wilted from the stalks. And the UFO researchers who investigated this case hypothesized that these soybean plants had been, quote, subjected to intense heat. So it's not clear whether this object actually landed or if it was just hovering above the area because the plants themselves were not broken off or crushed. But there's great photos of these landing traces. Uh, UFO investigators arrived on the scene shortly after it occurred. There were investigators from both the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, and the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, APRO. Uh, they interviewed the witnesses and uh, confirmed that these landing trace cases did actually exist. Dr. J. Allen Hynek visited the site, and he says, and I quote, I still don't know what the hell this thing is all about. It looked as though a big heater had been held six feet above the ground. Investigators later learned that the neighbors said that their dogs were making a racket on that evening. And this case was considered one of the best landing trace cases on record at that time because it had multiple witnesses and investigators arrived on the scene shortly after and were able to interview the witnesses and confirm the landing trace cases. So... These cases, again, occur all over the world. And the next case I'd like to discuss occurred almost exactly one year later, and on August 30th, 1970, at Lake Anton, Sweden. Uh, the main witness is Richard Johansson. Uh, actually, it's his property where these landing trace cases were discovered. He himself did not see anything. But when he went outside that morning, he found all these weird marks in his backyard. So he alerted investigators who conducted a very thorough investigation. They took samples of these landing traces and tests showed high levels of gamma radiation. And while Richard Johansson didn't see anything, investigators learned that there were, in fact, dozens of witnesses to UFO activity in that exact area on that night. There's a road that passes by Johansson's property, and witnesses were stopping their cars and watching these red lights hovering at treetop level, dropping down behind the trees. Uh, some witnesses said they saw these objects sending down beams of light, and this went on for couple of hours on the evening before these landing trace cases were discovered by the owner of this property. So yeah, nearly a dozen witnesses saw UFO activity, and then there are these 
very prominent landing trace marks that are directly where this object was hovering. It is a great UFO landing trace case. One year later, June 25, 1971, there was a very interesting case which took place in Alsace, a little town in France. Uh, this occurred in the evening at about 11 p.m. There were two witnesses, 18-year-old Joel Schweitzer and his friend who wants to remain anonymous. They were returning home after visiting a friend when they saw a light in the distance to the northeast. They first thought it looked like an electric flashlight. It was quite distant from them, but it started to get closer, and they realized it was strange and began to look at it. They said it was very bright. It appeared to be spinning, and as they watched, it came down over the girls' private school in this area and getting closer and closer. And as it got very close to them, they could see that it was, in fact, a disc. One side of this disc was completely flat, and the other was bulged. And as this object approached, it was in a vertical position to the meadow. And they said it was about 45 feet overhead. This disc then stopped, hovered in a vertical position for about two to three seconds, and slowly began to dim in brightness. But it was still bright enough where it lit up the whole area. This object then performed a reversal maneuver and basically went horizontal, uh, and the flat side of it tilted to face the ground. And it still felt like this object was rotating very fast, like a children's top, and they could now see that there was a white light beacon on the top of the object, which was blinking. And after a few seconds, this object descended to the ground very slowly. They did not hear any noise. There were numerous dogs in this area who did not react. At this point, the two friends uh, became a little bit frightened and were about to run away. Then they saw this object had actually stopped and remained stationary about 75 feet away. They said it looked like it landed in the field, and if not landed, it was very close to the ground, within a foot or two. Uh, it lit up this whole area. They could not see any feet or landing gear uh, because it was so bright. And this object remained in place for about a minute and a half, then went up vertically, slowly, and started to rotate again, moving off slowly, and then suddenly darted off at high speed in a horizontal position. They estimate that this object was about 24 feet in diameter and about 6 feet high, metallic. And the next day in the morning, they went to this spot to see if there was any evidence, and they found landing traces in the grass where this object had been. As it turns out, this was a meadow which had been mown, cut down, a few days before. The vegetation, which was mostly alfalfa, was about 6 to 12 inches in height. UFO investigators converged on the scene, and they measured these traces, photographed them. The traces were a circle of just over 18 feet in diameter. And in the center of these traces, there was a very prominent H symbol, which was about six and one-fourth feet long. They also found three circular marks just under three feet in diameter and a small square hole. So again, they took photos, they drew the marks, made a diagram uh, according to the witnesses. And the investigators, this grass was flattened and appeared to be blackened, but not actually burned. It appeared as if it had been exposed to some source of heat. They speculated that the blacking marks were actually soot. Uh, this case is quite controversial. There were accusations of a possible hoax, largely because of this H, which was very much like an H in a normal alphabet and very similar to a standard helicopter landing pad. 
So it's hard to say. Uh, the witnesses uh, do not think this was a helicopter. It made no noise. Uh, there was no wind. And there was no evidence of any helicopter flight. Uh, but these marks are very prominent and were investigated by researchers. So it is a very interesting landing trace case. And again, not the only one. It was just a few months later, that same year, when one of the most famous landing trace cases in all of UFO history occurred. This was on November 2nd, 1971, in Delphos, Kansas. The main witness is 16-year-old Ron Johnson, and he was outside his home in Delphos with his dog Snowball when he saw a metallic object hovering only a few feet above the ground in his backyard. This object was making a very loud noise and was blindingly bright, so bright, in fact, that it caused after images on his retina. And as this object began to leave, Ron ran inside and got his parents, who came outside just in time to see this object moving off. And now, looking down where this object had hovered, they saw a glowing ring, which they said, and I quote, felt strange, like a slick crust, as if the soil was crystallized. Ron's mother bent down and touched the soil, which she said caused her finger to be numb. She rubbed it off on her leg, and her leg became numb. This numbness lasted for some time. It rained that night, but in the morning, the strange ring was completely dry. That was weird. And it remained in place for quite some time. When snow fell later in the winter, the snow melted everywhere but on that ring. So investigators converged on the scene. Soil samples were taken and sent to a lab. And there were some weird results. There was a substance in these... Uh, samples, which was an organic organism related to Actinomycetalis, which Jacques Vallée, a very well-known investigator, described as an, quote, intermediate organism between bacteria and fungus. This is a material which can fluoresce under certain circumstances. So they speculate that perhaps the radiation or energy from this object affected the organisms that were already in this area. At any rate, police and reporters did show up on the scene, confirmed the presence of the ring. Investigators did as well. Uh, it's still there to this day. And later, there was another witness in the area who said that he saw an object descending towards Delphos at the time of this incident. This case has never been explained as anything other than an actual UFO landing and is considered by many to be one of the very best verified landing trace cases on record. And here's a little clip I'd like to play about this case. This is a small portion of the soil taken from a UFO landing site in Delphos, Kansas. The soil in the UFO landing ring is extremely dehydrated and is unable to absorb water. Instead, it simply floats. Soil taken only a few feet away that was not part of the UFO landing ring behaved normally. Within a few seconds, it absorbed the water that we poured on it. Besides being unable to absorb water, UFO-affected soil cannot support seed germination and plant life. Soil taken a few feet away does support normal plant growth. All right, moving along. Another very interesting case occurred on November 12, 1972, at the Rosemead High School in Middleburg, South Africa. It was around 9.30 p.m. on that evening when two police officers noticed a glowing object over a nearby hill. 
they watched it through binoculars and said that as they watched it, it actually changed color and shape. And while they were watching it, there were other witnesses in the area, four men who had been hired to guard the nearby petrol dump next to this hill. And they watched this object descend and hover or land directly on the fenced in tennis courts of the Rosemead High School. Two of these witnesses, P.K. Nell and S.J. Rousseau, said that the red lights were directly on the court itself, moving in a circular pattern. And as one of them said, and I quote, it looked as if someone in a car without headlights, but with taillights burning, were riding around in circles on the tennis court. This is what they told the police who later investigated this case. The lights then disappeared, after which the entire petrol dump became illuminated by a strange incandescent light. Meanwhile, there were other witnesses. The principal of Rosemead High School, Harold Truder, lived next door to the school and the tennis courts, and he and his family observed weird lights, what they described as a beam, like a searchlight coming down from the sky. They watched it for several minutes, after it left, he went outside to examine the area and realized that they were right over the tennis courts, which had been severely damaged, and huge chunks of tar had been gouged from the courts. And this was very strange, because these tennis courts were guarded by a tall chain-link fence and secured by a locked gate, which was not disturbed. So he went the next morning to investigate more closely, confirmed that the skate was still locked, the fence was undamaged, the floors of the tennis courts, however, were almost completely torn up, and in fact, he found several lumps of tar stuck high up on the fence. This is when he called the police, who arrived that morning and began an investigation, and they searched the area and found lumps of tar from this tennis court on a hill some distance away. And what was really strange was while the tar on this court had been torn up, none of it was actually overturned. So theories ranged widely as to what could have caused this, anything from a gas explosion or a whirlwind, but these theories had to be discarded. They did not account for the UFO sightings. And one gentleman, an uh, astronomer by the name of Mr. E. Van Zyl, he examined the tennis courts and found no evidence of heat or melting. And according to one source, there were, in fact, different sets of symmetrically placed imprints found on this tennis court. There was further evidence that uh, something had been there, because following this incident, a large blue gum tree located right next to the tennis courts showed signs of damage, possibly scorching, because the green shoots at the base of the tree mysteriously died off and some of the leaves had been torn off and the foliage itself was withered. These landing traces became very well known. They were viewed by hundreds of people. Uh, people crowded around these tennis courts. Nobody was able to provide any explanation other than that a UFO of some kind had caused them. So why this UFO landed on these tennis courts and tore them up remains a mystery. Perhaps it left this evidence on purpose, sort of a calling card to announce its presence. Uh, I, I can only speculate, but it is an excellent landing trace case. One year later, October 6, 1973, Mr. and Miss N.R. of St. Matthias de Chambly in Quebec, Canada, were taking a walk near their home when they saw a brilliant light rising from the field. And the next, the next morning, there was still activity. They saw smoke rising from this field in the same area. And looking, they saw this yellow dome-shaped object. And as they watched, this object uh, emitted another object. A smaller object came out of the larger one. At this point, they saw five small figures. And at first, they thought that perhaps they were Boy Scouts, but it was very strange because these figures each wore bright yellow suits and what appeared to be a helmet. And they were 
moving very quickly, carrying something between these two objects. So they watched this for about 15 minutes, at which point they turned away, and when they looked back, this object was gone. So they were quite puzzled, uh, wondering, was this Boy Scouts or what? Uh, they were very much puzzled because there was no roads to this area. And uh, investigation from researchers later revealed that their neighbor had seen what was apparently the same object take off uh, from this area. It was their daughter who first went to investigate where this object had landed, and she found a 45-foot circle of burned and crushed grass. And apparently there may have been some radiation because after leaving this area, she became quite ill with a headache, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, this was not verified scientifically, but nevertheless, this remains a very intriguing landing trace case. And there are quite a few in Canada. It was just one year later, not even, on June 25, 1974, when Mr. and Miss L of St. Cyril de Wendover in Quebec, Canada, saw a red glowing object making a loud thrumming noise just outside their trailer home. It was very close, about 15 feet from their window, and looking out, they also saw four six-foot-tall robotic-like figures examining the empty trailer next to theirs. These were not normal people. These figures had what looked like glowing red rings around their torsos. They floated rather than walked, and the object itself, they said, was domed and had red and white lights on top and orange lights around the base and was casting yellow beams of light onto the ground. Investigators converged onto the scene and discovered and photographed three sets of tripod imprints, presumably left by this dome-shaped UFO on the far side of the creek. Uh, these landing traces showed that the grass in this area was swept in a, quote, nest fashion. Uh, later, this area was mowed down, and the grass in this area grew twice as high as the other grass nearby. There was other evidence found, including several flat pieces of a, quote, strange substance of white color. It was similar to plastic and was found where these robotic-like creatures had been seen. There's no other information on in this case, but nevertheless, it's a very well-verified and interesting case of a UFO landing trace. Just a few months later, that same year, also in Canada, on August 16, 1974, three young boys, age 7 to 10, were returning to their homes at Port Coquitlam in British Columbia, Canada. They heard a high-pitched whining sound and saw an object moving over some trees and starting to land in a nearby field. One of the boys, David Bates, was holding his pet cat. The cat became very frightened when this object appeared and squirmed and eventually leapt from David's arms. It ran just a short distance, then dropped in its tracks mysteriously and was unconscious. The boys looked up at this object. They said it had a red light on top and green and white flashing lights on its edges. It was very, very loud, making this loud whining noise so loud it hurt their ears. As this object landed, the cat woke up. Uh, David scooped up his cat again, and they approached this object to within 150 feet, close enough that as it landed, they could feel the heat and a blast of dust coming from this object. They could also see landing legs and blue sparks coming from underneath the object. The object, they said, was saucer-shaped. It had a weird chain-like markings around the circumference, and as they watched, they could also see a doorway. And seeing this doorway was enough to frighten them away. They fled the area in fear and ran home, ran inside, said there was a UFO outside. They slammed the door closed, locked it, 
ran to the windows, started closing all the shutters. Uh, no one believed them until the next day when they returned with a neighbor and found landing traces, indentations on the ground, and burned marks. One, this neighbor actually touched the landing traces and she said her hand instantly became numb. They called UFO researchers who investigated this area and based on the size of the landing trace cases, they determined that this object was about 20 feet in diameter and not only was there crushed grass, but they also found a chalk-like dust. Uh, they brought out a radiation detector, but found no evidence of radiation. Uh, one interesting detail was noted. The mother of one of the witnesses, David Bates' mother, said that her clock had mysteriously run one hour ahead on the night of the incident. She couldn't explain it. This was something that never happened before or since. So there are some very interesting details to this case but most important here are these landing traces. All right, moving along. Still that same year, again in Canada, just two weeks later actually, on September 1st, 1974, is one of Canada's most famous cases of all. The main witness is a farmer by the name of Edwin Fuhrer of Langenberg in Saskatchewan, Canada. He was out in the fields next to his home. He grows a crop called rape, and he saw a bun-shaped metallic object hovering one foot over the crops in his field, and there were four other objects hovering slightly higher nearby. And he walked around this object. He approached right close to it, and he could see that the grass was being swirled in a clockwise motion. And seeing that this object was spinning and swirling this grass, he became alarmed and stepped back a little bit, but still observed it from a very near location and watched these objects for about 15 min minutes. And finally, after 15 minutes, this one object lifted up, emitting a vapor or mist and a strong blast of wind, and it left, followed by the four other objects. He called the police, the uh, constables, who came and verified the incident. According to Edwin Fuhrer, his cattle did seem to react to the presence of this object. And police investigators later found other weird landing traces, circles, in this same area. And according to Constable Morier, and I quote, they took me out to where they'd seen these things in the grass. I saw the rings. Something was there, and I doubt it was a hoax. There was no indication anything had been wheeled in or out, and Mr. Fuhrer seemed genuinely scared. It's a very well-verified case of a UFO landing trace. And here we go with another one, also in Canada. This occurred on July 6, 1975, in an area known as Mount Pleasant in Ontario, Canada. This is also a very famous case. The main witness is a tobacco farmer by the name of Joe Borda, who saw what looked like a silver dome-shaped object land in his tobacco field. And his first thought that was that it was perhaps his neighbor's irrigation truck. Those neighbors said no, that could not be because they were not in that area at that time. And of course this object didn't look like a tractor, it was silver and domed. And Joe started to approach it when he heard a voice say to him, do not pay attention, <laughs> go away, which he did. And uh, when he looked again, this object was gone, but investigating where it had landed, he found a circular depression about 20 to 30 feet in diameter. Some of the uh, grass in this area was burnt, some of the tobacco plants rather. A greenish blue oily residue was also found. Police arrived, they took samples, and they told Joe 
that they believed the marks in the residue were caused by lightning strike, something which Joe Borda disagreed with. It was a ridiculous debunking explanation. Uh, he called UFO researchers, and together they tried for years to get the results back from these scientific labs, but were never able to get them. Later, what appeared to be intelligence officers from the U.S. arrived, and they seemed to know exactly where this UFO had landed because they went straight to the landing site and gathered samples. Joe Borda ran out, ran out there, confronted them, and basically ordered them off his property. But they already got their samples, and they were gone. So this is a case that has never been solved. An investigator has written a book about this case, and it is another very well-verified case of a landing trace. And again, these occur all over the world. One year later, in February of 1976, there was an excellent case in Kettering in Tasmania. The main witness is Anonymous, a 39-year-old man who was woken up by his young child crying in his home. And looking outside, he saw what he first thought was a plane coming down from the east towards the shore of Little Oyster Cove. And he could see a widespread glow emanating from this area. So thinking that it was a plane accident, he quickly approached this area, still dressed in his sleeping clothes. And from a little hill, looking down, he had an unobstructed view about 75 feet away, and saw a dome-shaped object. It had little portholes around the object, which were giving off a bright light. He said the exterior of this object looked like aluminum, with ribbing or ridging uh, going down from the top of this object. And below the windows, there was a small ledge that led to the base with a short vertical side. There was three or four win win windows, and through these windows he could see a tall cylindrical shaped feature which looked very much like a ship's compass mounting, he said. He also saw motionless gray shapes, which he thought were perhaps seats with headrests or perhaps even entities. He did hear a humming noise, like an electric motor, and he heard this as he approached this object. And at some point, this object rose from the ground. The noise became much louder. It gained elevation slowly, and once it got up into the sky, it darted off at high speed, was a little dot in the sky, and was gone. The witness estimates this whole incident lasted about seven minutes, and when morning arrived, he went back to this spot and found that the rough grass in this area appeared to be scorched in a circle where the object had landed. All this grass later died, and here's where it gets even more interesting. Following this incident, in the months later, the area where this object had landed, the grass grew much tougher and higher. So the Tasmanian UFO Investigation Center visited the site and verified this landing trace area and could see that the affected area stood out as much greener than the surrounding area. And they could find no significant differences in the thermoluminescent content of the soil, but the results indicated no large doses of ionizing radiation. One case which occurred later that year in June of 1976, and actually for many years beyond that, is a very controversial case and one of the most famous cases in the world. It occurred in an area by the name of Hinwell, Switzerland, and the main witness is a farmer by the name of Billy Meyer. Billy Meyer is, of course, most famous for taking numerous, very clear photographs and films of UFOs. Billy Meyer says he's been in touch with human-looking ETs, which he calls Pleiadians or Plejarans. His main contact is Simyazi. This case, again, is quite controversial. 
There have been accusations of a hoax and some evidence of a hoax, but a lot of the evidence has never been explained. There are metal fragments which were investigated by scientist Marcel Vogel, who said were quite unusual. There are also literally hundreds of witnesses who have seen these UFOs in Billy Meyer's presence, which have never been explained. So this case did somewhat divide the UFO community. There are some who insist it's a hoax and some who say, no, it's absolutely valid. Uh, but interesting here, there are many examples of landing trace cases that have never been explained. These include circular depressions in a triangular formation of swirled and crushed grass, as well as melted ice and snow. There are numerous books about this case, written primarily by Wendell Stevens, who is a big believer in this case. Researcher Gary Kinder also wrote the book Light Years and came away convinced. And there are other books on this case. Many people still stand behind Billy Meyer. I present this case for what it's worth because it does involve numerous landing trace uh, evidence which occurred not only in 1976, but 77, 78, and in the years beyond this. So make of it what you will. And it's certainly not the only case. Another very impressive case occurred on October 8, 1978, in Jenkins, Missouri. This occurred early in the morning at 7 a.m. when a farming family noticed an unusual object in the field south of their home. It was about 185 feet from their house, so they couldn't make it out too clearly, and at first they didn't realize it was unusual, and they speculated that perhaps a large piece of trash or something had been blown over to this area the previous evening. So while they did see it and saw that it was unusual, sort of dome-shaped, they did not at first go to investigate it. There were six family members, five adults, and a teenager who continued to glance at this object over the next two hours, but it just stayed there in place. It was around 9 a.m. when the owner of the house was leaving the house to do some chores, and at that moment, he watched as this object rapidly rose from the ground to a height of about 30 to 50 feet, Everyone else in the house ran out to watch, and they all watched this object move slowly and silently to the west, ascending rapidly. It turned twice and gradually flew away. And as they watched it, they saw a second larger and more distant object also in the sky, and these two objects came close together and moved off in tandem. They described this object as looking like an oval or egg shape. It was white when it was on the ground, but when it went into the sky, it appeared to be more silvery and reflective, and they estimated that its size was about four to five feet on the longer dimension and three to four feet in the other direction. They also noted that one surface was darker in tone, and it could... They knew this because they could see that this object was, in fact, rotating. So after it left, they immediately called the sheriff's department. A deputy arrived that afternoon and went to the landing site. He took pictures as well as soil samples, and he could see a noticeable trace on the ground, which measured four and a half feet long and three and a half feet wide. And this, these landing traces were described as depressed vegetation, crushed vegetation, not burnt nor dried, and the soil moisture in this area was normal. This object did not appear to be very heavy because the ground itself was not affected, just the vegetation. Uh, radiation readings were taken and there was no evidence of radioactivity. This was investigated by UFO trace expert Ted Phillips. Uh, ho however, as time went on, there was 
other effects noted. And in fact, the area where this grass had land or this object had landed, the grass deteriorated in exactly this area. Also, uh, the grass in this area was also swirled. The case was investigated by MUFON and QFOS, uh, and they verified these landing traces and said that the grass appeared to be slightly burnt or perhaps discolored like a spot which had been over fertilized. They did take samples, sent them to a college laboratory which showed no unusual chemicals or volatile organics or solvents or fertilizer or anything. It was not a balloon because they asked the farmer and he said, that, oh yeah, he had recovered weather balloons previously and he knew very well what these looked like. There were cows in this area who did not react to the presence of this object, but nevertheless, it's a very well verified case. There's multiple witnesses. Landing traces were, were tested in a lab and verified by police and UFO investigators. So yeah, it's a great case. Next case I'd like to talk about occurred in West Lothian, Scotland and has come to be known as the Detchmont Woods Incident. This occurred in the Detchmont Woods on November 9, 1979. The main witness is forestry worker Robert Taylor. He had gone into the Detchmont Woods. He parked his truck and walked with his dog into the forest about a thousand feet into the forest to pick some saplings. And that's when he came upon a clearing inside of which there was a 20 foot wide silvery object. He said it was silvery gray, rough textured, metallic, and had some weird protrusions on it. And he said it looked almost camouflaged. So he approached closer to investigate, at which point two small three foot wide metallic spheres came out. They reminded him of sea mines and they made a weird plopping noise as they rolled towards him along the ground. And before he could get away, they attached themselves to his legs, to his pants, and began hissing and emitting a terrible odor, which he said was like burning automobile brake linings. This caused him to cough and gasp for air. And these little circular objects started to drag Robert towards the larger object, and at this point he lost consciousness. He woke up an undetermined time later. He was quite weak. He was unable to speak. He had a powerful headache, and he was very much disoriented. He made it back to his truck and drove home. Didn't make it all the way home. He crashed his truck into a ditch and had to walk the rest of the way. But he finally made it home, stumbled into his house. His wife was absolutely shocked to see his condition and she wanted to call the police. But Robert was hesitant to do that because he didn't think they would believe him. So they called a friend and a doctor. And the next day, Robert Taylor and his friend returned to the site of the event and discovered strange indentations on the forest floor. One of these sets of indentations was described as looking very much like rungs in a ladder, while the other indentations, which numbered about 40 in total, were suspected to be tracks left by these smaller objects, these round spheres. There were no scorch marks seen on the forest floor. This was eventually investigated by the police, the staff of the Livingston Development Corporation also took photographs of the scene. UFO researchers became interested and interviewed Robert Taylor and also investigated the area. Uh, the only tracks found were these weird markings on the earth. And this case has now become very well known and is in fact one of Scotland's most famous cases. 
Another very, very famous case occurred in the late days of December 1980, over a period of days actually, and this has come to be known as the Bentwaters Incident or the Rendlesham Forest Incident. This is in England, and it was a days-long event involving dozens of witnesses, multiple objects, uh, some sent down beams of light, and at least one of these objects landed in the forest itself. There were witnesses who were able to approach and walk around this object or even touch it. Some did experience physiological reactions as a result. There was a lot of other witnesses in the area who lived around who saw these strange lights. Many reported animal reactions. There was official confirmation from the government that this object did in fact land and was seen by many, many of the military officers. So it's a very well verified event. There are over a dozen books on this case. It's a very complicated case. So I won't get into all the details other than to say that there was landing trace evidence. The area where this object had landed, they found little holes where these apparent legs or landing gear had landed. Also, radiation readings were taken and were found to be significantly higher where this object had landed than in the surrounding area. So many people know about this case, but what is not well known is that there are landing traces which were scientifically verified. Just days later, France's best verified UFO landing trace occurred on January 8, 1981. The main witness is a man by the name of Renato Nicolai, and this occurred in an area called trans en provence in France. And Renato Nicolai was outside his home when he heard a whistling sound. He turned around and saw that a classic metallic saucer had landed in his field. Uh, this object took off almost immediately, but looking where it had landed, he saw burn marks and significant depressions on the ground. He immediately called the police, and UFO investigators also arrived, and this soon became one of the most studied landing trace cases really in the world. Samples were taken, multiple samples, and studied in multiple scientific labs. French investigators studied these landing marks and determined that this object must have weighed about four to five tons and heated the ground uh, to a temperature of about an estimated 570 to 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very hot. Inside this ring where the object had landed, the soil was crushed and the chlorophyll in the plants and vegetation were largely destroyed. There was possible radiation. The plants themselves appeared to have been aged as if their growth was accelerated. And judging from how deep the soil was depressed, yeah, this object was very, very heavy, <laughs> four to five tons. It's quite amazing. It's one of the most studied and best verified UFO landings, not only in France, but in all of UFO history, and is definitely France's most famous landing trace case, next to the Maurice Mass case in Valensol. Now I'd like to move on to another case, which occurred in the United States on June 30, 1983. The main witness is Debbie Jordan Cobble. She was also known as Kathy Davis and became the star witness in Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders. This occurred in a small town outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, but is often labeled the Copley Woods UFO landing. It's quite a complicated case. Uh, Debbie Jordan on that evening saw that the door to her pool house was open and glowing with a weird light. She checked again and saw that the 
Light was now out and the door was closed. She was going off to her neighbor's house, but her mom called her back and said that there was this weird glowing light outside. So Debbie came back and went into the backyard to investigate and walked straight into one of the most traumatic UFO encounters of her life. It was this incident that woke her up to the fact that she was, in fact, a lifelong contactee. What she remembered on this particular evening was being blinded, blinded by a very bright white light. She saw other lights. This was quite an involved experience, but at one point she saw an 8 to 10 foot egg-shaped object landed in her backyard, and there were six short figures with large heads lined up alongside it who entered into the object. At this point, Debbie's memory became somewhat shrouded in amnesia. She returned to the house to find that she had been missing, and her mom was quite concerned when was, was about to call the police. And as Debbie says, and I quote, It seemed I was gone about two hours, but I only remembered about 15 minutes worth of the experience. But her memory was quite clouded at this point. She didn't realize how unusual this event was, did not remember. And shortly after it occurred, she and other family members decided to go swimming. And this is when they first noticed something very unusual. And I will just quote Debbie directly, as Debbie says, As we walked through the backyard to the swimming pool, my neighbor's daughter suddenly jumped up and yelled, Ouch! She said something. She said she had stepped on something that made her foot burn, and now her foot was getting numb. By the time we reached the pool, she said her foot felt numb all the way to the knee, but yet she could walk on it. We weren't in the pool more than 10 or 15 minutes when we all started feeling nauseated, and my eyesight started getting real fuzzy, even though I had not had my head underwater. I could see halos all around the outside lights, and it was making me dizzy. The girls left, and I went to bed. The next morning, Debbie woke up to find that her eyes were swollen shut. She was rushed to the hospital and sent to see a specialist. And as she says, the doctor was stunned at the extent of my injury. He kept asking me if I had looked into the arc of a welder's torch or the sun. I had not. I was given several tubes of cream and some drops to try to heal my eyes. According to Debbie, it took several weeks for her eyes to recover, and to this day, they are sensitive to light. She's farsighted, and still her eyes will burn and turn red, and she still has problems with it. A few days later, for the July 4th celebration, they went into the backyard, and this is when they really noticed the landing traces. And again, I'd like to quote Debbie directly. As she says, My nephew was the first to notice the marks in the yard. It was an eight-foot circle with a 20-foot swath coming off it. The swath ended in a perfect arch and was exactly two feet wide. All the grass in this mark was brownish-gray and wilted. The dirt was gray and hard. The first thing my mother said when she saw that mark was, Oh, that's where our UFO landed. I just looked at her like she was nuts, and I thought to myself, What is wrong with her? Suddenly, as I looked at this mark, I began to panic. I could feel my pulse race and the sweat beating on my brow. I started feeling faint, and I started remembering without hypnosis. So she began to recall seeing this craft had landed, figures, and so forth. And this caused a great deal of consequences for several years. Uh, she got sick and stayed sick for over a year. She developed life-threatening allergies, rashes, fevers, swollen glands, diarrhea, bleeding gums. Her hair started falling out. Her fingernails grew thin and more. She had irregular heartbeat, panic attacks daily for a long time. Also, her dog became very sick and died two months later. Uh, significant here are these landing traces. And as Debbie says, the mark in the yard remained there for nearly five years. Every year, snow melted off of it. 
Animals would not walk on it. There were no bugs in the soil. Even when the grass finally did begin to grow back, the grass in that place was thick, rubbery, and kind of a bluish green color. The dandelions that grew around the mark were three times the size of normal ones. The tomato plants my mom had out by the pool were the size of grapefruits, but when you tried to eat them, they were so acidic, the skin on your lips would peel off, and the vines were as big as round as my forearms. The leaves on a patch of trees behind the mark withered, turned brown, and fell off, and the power lines above the mark shorted out and blew a transformer, melted the wiring, and blew out the tubes on the Heathkit ham radios in the basement of the house, which was right next to the place in the yard. And that's not all. Debbie later found out that her neighbors saw literally hundreds of orbs of light in the trees that night. And again, her case was investigated by Bud Hopkins, who, Debbie says, spent an enormous amount of time and money doing a very thorough investigation. And Debbie was subjected to an array of medical and psychological tests. She passed a lie detector test. And Bud Hopkins, again, wrote the book Intruders, The Incredible Visitations at Copley Woods. And Debbie Jordan Cobble has since written a few books herself, most notably the book Abducted, and very recently another book called Extraordinary Contact. It's a very well-verified landing trace case, uh, not to mention the pretty alarming physiological effects and all the other eyewitnesses. This next case caught the attention of the entire world when the Russian TASS news service announced that on September 29, 1989, a UFO had landed in a park in Voronezh, Russia. Uh, at the time, several children were playing in the Voronezh Park when they observed a pinkish glow approaching them in the sky. And it got closer and closer, and they could now see that this was a deep red ball-shaped object. There were several kids who saw this, including Lina Sarokina, Vazia Surin, Vova Starsev, Alyosha Nikonov, Zenya Blinov, Sergei Makarov, and Yulia Sholokova. And they watched as this object flew around in circles over the park for a few minutes, and then it disappeared, it left. Moments later, it returned, hovered briefly, and began to descend very close to the ground. It got about a foot or two off the ground when a hatch opened up and a very tall, wide figure appeared. It had very t long legs, very long arms, and a very small head, this being moved around slowly, looking around. And the children said this figure had what appeared to be three luminous eyes, with the middle one moving around like radar. They also saw a shield-like object on its, on its chest. This being then closed the hatch, and the object landed gently on four legs. The hatch opened again, and three identical huge humanoids, again with small knob-like heads, stepped out. These ones wore silvery overalls and had bronze-colored boots, and they were followed by a fourth figure, a strange boxy-like robot. And all four of these figures began to walk around the object several times, at one point, a beam of light was emitted from one of the being's chest. It hit the ground, creating luminous triangles. The children thought it was trying to communicate. They were also surprised when at one point, the craft and the beings themselves became invisible and then reappeared. At one point, the, one of the children, one of the boys, screamed in fear. And at that point, he was unable to move. And then one of the beings looked at a boy and pointed a tube-like instrument at him, and this boy disappeared. 
when this luminous beam hit him. And uh, other children described this craft as having a weird H-like symbol, which interestingly had been reported by other people in different UFO incidents. Uh, after just a few moments, the figures returned back to the craft, closed the hatch, and it lifted off the ground, at which point the boy who had disappeared reappeared. And that was the end of the incident. A huge investigation followed, and it turned out that people had seen UFOs in this area prior to the incident and afterwards. And during this incident, there was another witness, a police lieutenant by the name of Sergei Matveyev, and he said he saw a strange object flying in the sky at the time of this incident. There were landing traces, uh, several different kinds, according to Zhenrik Silonov, who was then head of the Voronezh Geophysical Laboratory. He talked to investigators who identified the landing site, and they described a circle with a diameter of around 20 feet. There were also several dents in the ground, imprints in the ground, that they said looked like elephant footprints. There were holes in the ground. There was crushed grass. There was also a poplar tree that appeared to have become tilted as a result of this landing. Radiation detectors were, were brought in, and this area was found to have an above average presence of the radioactive isotope cesium. This was disputed by some people who thought that perhaps these readings were due to the Chernobyl nuclear power station accident some three years earlier. Nevertheless, this is a very interesting case with multiple eyewitnesses and hard physical evidence in the form of landing traces. Next case I'd like to talk about occurred in Canada. This was in mid-November of 1990, uh, and the main witness is Ivan McColeman. He lived in Spring Bay, Ontario, Canada, and at the time of this incident, there was a lot of UFOs being seen in the area. He himself did not see any UFOs, but when he went out to examine his property, he found several weird marks in his field. And I'll just quote Ivan McColeman directly. As Ivan says, I always go up to my property up there, which is a hundred acres of ranch, and I generally go up once a week to check it. I think it was the latter part of September when I went up one morning around 10 o'clock and went into where they are now located, these circles, and I found them. I could see them before I even got to them. There was something there that wasn't there before. When I got within 20 feet, I noticed that the gravel, which was always there and was packed very tight there, had been sucked right away in two different places, and the diameter of both circles would be about six feet, I guess. And the gravel was sucked right away, right down to the bare rock. I looked at them for, I suppose, 15 or 20 minutes. I had no idea what they were, Although I've heard about these markings from other places, this was the first one I had ever seen that I found on my own property. So while he did not see any UFOs in this area, he did see the marks and other witnesses in the area had seen UFOs. So it's a fairly well verified landing trace case. And another case occurred some years later on October 24th, 1998, the main witness is anonymous. Uh, her name is Miss H, and she lived in an area known as Grand Mare, Quebec. Uh, looking outside her home late one evening, she noticed two strange figures in her neighbor's vegetable garden. She says they were dressed completely in white and looked like astronauts wearing helmets. They were leaning over and picking something up off the ground. She said they floated rather than walked. She also said that there was a strange glowing fog surrounding them. 
She watched for about three minutes, at which point she realized how unusual these were. They probably weren't human, and she became quite frightened. She turned away, and when she finally got the courage to look out the window again, they were gone. She called UFO researchers, who were very impressed. And according to the report by the investigators, and I quote, when visited by our representative, ground traces were noted and photographed. There were four of them, two measuring 12 inches in diameter and two 10 inches. Five identical holes of two inches in diameter by eight inches deep were discovered. Photos were taken. Some footprints, which seemed to correspond to club feet, were also noted. Soil samples were collected and members of the team noticed a great difference in the texture of the dirt. The dirt found inside the holes seems to have been completely sieved and was brown in color, while the dirt outside the holes from 1 to 20 feet away was of a thick consistency and rich like normal garden black earth. So again and again we see it's not only affecting the soil, it is causing m deep depressions. It's affecting the vegetation, sometimes burning it, sometimes causing the vegetation to grow in weird ways. Many different types of landing trace cases. Another very interesting and relatively recent case occurred on August 11, 2003. This was in Szczynik, Poland and again occurred on August 11, 2003 at 5 a.m. when a man by the name of Lech Chesinski was driving down the road and he saw three strange figures standing on the shoulder of the road ahead of him. They were wearing uniforms that reminded him of an astronaut and they were standing in a perfect triangle formation and as he drove up to them, he could see that these were not normal people. They weren't astronauts. And he stopped his car, and these three beings moved right in front of his car, still keeping in the same triangular pattern. And one of these beings raised his arm as if signaling uh, Lech to come to a complete stop, which he did. And he heard no audible voice, but he did hear something in his head telep telepathically, mentally, telling him to stop. And he says at this point he felt almost paralyzed, and these beings were right in front of his car so he could see them fairly clearly. Uh, through their darkened helmet he could make out no real facial features except for big black eyes. On the top of the helmet there was a weird device that he first thought might be a communications device. He wanted to run away, but before he could, a strong beam of light came up from the top of one of these beings' helmets, and he heard this question, mentally, do you hear us? And he mentally answered back, yes. He got out of his car, and these beings started to ask him questions. The first question they asked him was, what type of material is your car made of? And he did his best to answer. He now got a very good look at these beings, and he said that their suits were bluish in color, the shoes had a metallic look, and on the chest of these beings there was a rectangular device that looked electronic because it had lights moving on it. And these beings began to ask him all kinds of questions, such as, what kind of material are your clothes made of? How does your vehicle work? What kind of fuel does it use? Lech answered these questions telepathically, and then they told him that they had come to deliver a message to the inhabitants of Earth. And what they told him was that we should care about our planet, our water, our atmosphere, and our air. And they told him if we neglect our environment, this will cause our destruction. And Finally, towards the end of this counter, Lech Chesinski asked one of the beings a question, asking them, where do you come from? 
and they gave him a kind of strange answer and said, eight galaxy. At this point, the three figures began to float up into the air and levitated towards their ship, which was parked about 300 feet away off in the field by the road. And a beam came out of the bottom of the ship and struck the three figures, at which point they were taken inside the craft. A strange fog or mist appeared around this object. Leck could see that this object was sitting on three legs and had multicolored lights all over it. The ship rose up into the air about 50 feet high and disappeared from sight. And this was when he saw what looked like crushed circles of grass beneath the, where this craft had landed. And it's a very interesting uh, landing trace case. These landing traces came in the form of a large circle of crushed or swirled grass with six smaller circles situated in a perfect triangular formation around the circumference of this craft. It's a very interesting landing trace case. And the last case I want to talk about is somewhat controversial, but it's very interesting and quite recent, so I thought it deserved a place on this list. This occurred on October 8, 2005, in the city of Sarajevo. This is located in the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This case comes from a gentleman by the name of Rudolf Bosniak. And what's very interesting about this case is that there was a news reporter who was being interviewed and the cameraman actually caught videotape of this UFO that was hovering in the area shortly before these landing trace evidence was found a short distance away in Sarajevo. And I provide a link to this video in the notes on this channel, uh, on my YouTube channel, if you'd like to take a look at the video, and you can make up your own mind about it. But what's very interesting is you can see in this video this round saucer-shaped object. You can see witnesses looking at it and pointing. And according to Rudolf Bosniak, it left landing traces. As he says, the UFO left traces as landing points in front of the people's theater in Sarajevo. And this was apparently taken quite seriously and was published in newspapers in Sarajevo. So it's quite an interesting, although controversial, case. So there you go. That's more than 30 cases involving UFO landing traces. That's a lot, but it should only be considered a representative sample because there are a lot more than I presented here. These cases reach back decades. The cases I presented here reach back to the 1960s, but I do know of cases that predate that, and they are still occurring to the present day. Another very interesting aspect of these cases is how widespread they are, occurring all over our planet. What's also very interesting about the UFO landing trace cases is the variations of the types of landing traces. It's not only crushed vegetation and swirled grass. There are indentations in the ground, gouge marks. Sometimes the soil is pressed down what, by what appears to be a very heavy weight. Some of these cases involve soil that's been exposed to a very high heat source. Some involve radiation. And in fact, we see physiological effects in some of the witnesses who have gotten ill with what appears to be some type of mild radiation poisoning. People talk about their fingers becoming numb after touching the soil. Also very interesting are the cases in which there has been alterations to the plant growth. Not only is, are the, is the vegetation being burned, but in some cases the vegetation appears to be have accelerated growth. Uh, so that is also very interesting. I think an important takeaway from these cases is that they show that this phenomenon is physical. These objects are altering the terrain in a way that 
this could not possibly be explained as a psychological phenomena, which many skeptics have tried to do. Also very interesting are these cases sometimes involve a wide variety of evidence. It's, there are multiple witness sightings. Uh, sometimes there are humanoids being seen. Some of these cases have photographs, animal effects. There's a wide variety of things going on here. So this, the most important aspect of this case is that it does provide hard physical evidence and skeptics really don't have a leg to stand on in these cases because they prove UFO reality. And I wonder if that is why these landings are taking place. This is pure speculation, but why are these objects coming in for a landing? Most of these cases do not appear to involve what we would term onboard UFO encounters or abductions. Sometimes they're coming out to perhaps pick flowers or <laughs> dig in the soil, but sometimes they seem to just land and take off. And I'm wondering if they are doing that as a sort of display to prove their presence and provide hard physical evidence for all of us. Again, that's pure speculation. I don't know, but it does raise an interesting point. But most importantly, this is hard physical evidence that deserves a lot more attention than it's getting. And that's really why I wanted to do this episode for you today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I really want to thank you for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep looking for the truth, and most importantly, keep having fun.